Welcome to the Australian Naval History podcast series. It is a production of the Naval Studies Group at the University of New South Wales, Canberra, in partnership with the Australian Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society, the Submarine Institute of Australia, and the Sea Power Centre Australia. I'm Commander Alastair Cooper. Naval shipbuilding, indeed any shipbuilding, is a sophisticated endeavour which combines national, financial, technological and manufacturing capabilities. The capability takes years to develop and involves people just as much as machinery. Once created, it provides great benefits for defence and the economy more broadly. In Australia's history, the Cockatoo Island Dockyard was an important part of the nation's industrial capability and is a fascinating subject in its own right. This is the first of two podcasts about Australian naval shipbuilding and the Cockatoo Island Dockyard. It will look at the creation of Cockatoo Island and its development up to the Second World War. To tell the story in more detail, I'm joined by Mr. John Jeremy, the last Chief Executive of Cockatoo Dockyard, who wrote the book Cockatoo Island, Sydney's Historic Dockyard and two further detailed histories of the shipbuilding and repair activities at the dockyard. By Dr. David Stevens of the Naval Studies Group, well-known naval historian and author of numerous books about Australian naval history, and by Dr. Greg Gilbert, visiting fellow in the Naval Studies Group, who was once also a member of the Naval Overseeing Staff at Cockatoo Island. Gentlemen, welcome. John Jeremy, if I could start with you, could I ask you to describe where is Cockatoo Island? How big is it? Where, um, why did it become a dockyard in the first place? Well, Cockatoo Island is the largest island in Sydney Harbour. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, is currently about 40 acres in size, or 17 hectares. It was smaller than that originally, and it lies at the junction of the Parramatta and Lane Cove rivers. Mm -hmm. Its European use first began in 1839 as a penal settlement, mm -hmm. when 60 convicts were brought there from Norfolk Island and set to work to build their own accommodation and to quarry stone for works around uh, Sydney. In the 1840s, uh, there was a real need uh, for a graving dock uh, in this part of the world to service ships of the Royal Navy and other ships. Um, uh, for, for There was nothing. You had to careen or if there was a slip you had a slip, uh, otherwise you had to go a long way for a docking. Mm -hmm. uh, it was recommended by the New South Wales authorities to London that a dock be built on Cockatoo Island uh, for this purpose and sought a contribution from the Admiralty to its cost. The Admiralty initially declined, but finally came forth with some money before it was finished. And this dock became the Fitzroy Dock, which was opened on, in December 1857, uh, and was soon busy docking uh, government ships uh, and naval ships. By 1870, or around that time, it was clearly too small. Uh, the size of merchant ships in particular was growing substantially, uh, and uh, the liner Orient uh, which was the then the largest passenger liner in the world, about the size of a modern Navy frigate, mm -hmm. uh, couldn't fit into that dock. The decision was ultimately made to build another dock uh, on Cockatoo Island, uh, by, uh, which was intended at the time uh, to be able to dock any ship then being built or contemplated in the world. Mm -hmm. That dock was built by free labour and it became uh, the Sutherland Dock, uh, opened in 1890. Meanwhile, the administration of the dock, which had started under the convict administration, uh, was taken over by the Harbours and Rivers branch of the New South Wales Public Works Department in, uh, nine, in 1870. They began shipbuilding on Cockatoo Island in 1870, because in those times, if you wanted to move uh, up and down the coast of New South Wales, you went by sea. Uh, and uh, all the ports uh, on the coast of New South Wales uh, needed maintenance, dredging uh, and, uh, and uh, servicing. Uh, and that was done by the Harbours and Rivers Branch, large fleet of dredges, tugs and barges. They began building ships of that nature on Cockatoo Island uh, in, in 1870 and continued to do so right through until the end of the first decade uh, of the 20th century. Okay. The um, island uh, uh, had fairly basic facilities, although uh, they, they were built in extremely high standard. And the engineering workshop, uh, which was built beside the Fitzroy Dock is still there today and in fact along with the Fitzroy Dock and the convict, remaining convict buildings is World Heritage listed. After Federation in the first decade uh, of the 20th century 
the New South Wales government uh, foresaw opportunities uh, with the formation of the Commonwealth Naval Forces, and which became, of course, the Royal Australian Navy. Um, and uh, they, they thought there would be opportunities to build ships with this new navy. And they expanded the shipbuilding facilities on Cockatoo Island by the construction of a new shipyard south of the Fitzroy Dock uh, for the construction, possibly, of warships, as it turned out they did uh, in due course. Uh, so uh, by, uh, say, around 1910, uh, Cockatoo Island uh, was uh, well and truly in operation uh, as a dockyard, um, uh, but uh, with fairly limited facilities by the standard uh, which we, we, we've seen in the developed there in the 20th century. Okay, thank you. David Stevens, can you describe how shipbuilding fits into Australia's defence strategy and why it's important to the Navy? Yes, well, I'd like to begin with a quote, if I can, which is from one of our Governor Generals in the, in the 1950s, when he said, in the comparatively small compass of a ship, in her building and fitting out are brought together more human skills, more technical and scientific knowledge, more years of study and experience than in any other work of man. And I suggest that during this, this talk, we actually keep that in mind because it's very important when we think of ourselves as a maritime nation and a medium power, um, there's a very strong argument that we should have the ability to um, build, um, repair and sustain our own warships and certainly the latest white paper in 2016, the government there has said how important um, a shipbuilding capacity is for um, jobs and growth, uh, a growth in our economy. And they tend to do that by announcing a continuous shipbuilding plan. Mm -hmm. But what is very interesting, I think, is what Chief of Navy said in 2017, where he looked at the continuous sh shipbuilding plan and he said, it's what you really need to think about is the synergy or the synergistic nature of ships and the systems that they contain. And what he's saying is that Navy shouldn't just be a consumer of industrial output. It needs to be there as a partner in high technology. Yeah. And this continuous shipbuilding really is a means by which the Navy can um, uh, get access and encourage innovation such that the Navy will get the best ships possible and do it in Australia. No argument from me. <laughs> um, Greg Gilbert, most people are aware of the Australian um, fleets, or the fleet unit's arrival in 1913, but a fleet is not just made up of ships. Could you talk a little bit no, about what no, it's that? One, one of the things that, uh, obviously the fleet gets prominence in the media and uh, you know, amongst general people in the, or the public, but uh, behind the fleet is a navy and one of the problems the Australian Navy's had from its uh, Commonwealth inception was that we had the fleet, which performed very well, had very highly trained people and you know, fought in the First World War uh, very well. But behind the fleet, we needed the Navy. And very early on, uh, sorry, a Navy which includes uh, strategic underpinning personnel and training issues and also engineering and shipbuilding. Without that, that's the type of stuff that the Admiralty provided the British and the Royal Navy. For the early Australian Navy, we thought, well, we'll just rely on the Admiralty. You know, if we needed engineering or shipbuilding or whatever, we'll go to the Admiralty. The first ships that we bought for the Commonwealth Navy were directly off the shelf from the UK. You know, we'll just sail them out and run them. But that doesn't give you, or the first destroyers, the, that doesn't give you the support that you need to maintain and uh, keep those, the sustainability of the fleet going uh, within Australia. And it also doesn't mean, it means we're not independent of the efforts of the parent navy, in this case, the Royal Navy. So, to develop an independent Australian Navy, we really needed more than just the fleet. What we needed were all these other parts, the strategy, the personnel, and the shipbuilding. Now, the government at the time saw that. There was a bit of an argument in the first years of the Commonwealth, but by 1908, 9, 10, they saw that this is when we really needed to have an Australian shipbuilding enterprise. Uh, 
not just the construction of ships, but the whole gambit of how you build, maintain, and repair uh, warships. I guess we had to start somewhere, though, and um, there was um, the first Australian-built ship, um, I think, was built at Cockatoo. David, could you talk about that at all? HMAS Warrego, um, the torpedo boat destroyer. And just following on from what Greg has, has been talking about, certainly Admiral Creswell, um, from his early um, times arguing for the Navy, soon recognised that if he was going to encourage um, the government to invest in an in a independent Navy, there needed to be benefits for the nation as well, other than just the obvious um, defence and security. And so he certainly stressed the need to build our, you know, build ships ourselves. And as Greg mentioned, the need for some of these, these basics to support the Navy. And this seems to have been um, agreed by, certainly by um, Prime Minister um, Deakin and his successor Fisher, when they were talking about obtaining uh, the first um, flotilla of destroyers. And the, um, the decision that was made in, in nine, Deakin made the decision, but he lost power and Fisher had to continue through. And it wasn't until early 1909 that the um, order was made for the first destroyers of this flotilla. And the interesting thing was that they, uh, they the, the builders, the, the successful builders, um, not only had to, to build the destroyers, which were Parramatta and Yarra for Australia, but they had to employ Australian workers, at least a dozen each, to gain the skills. And the way they used those skills was that the third destroyer built, which was Warrego, was built in the United Kingdom, then disassembled, shipped to Australia, and then reassembled at Cockatoo Dockyard using that experienced uh, workforce that they'd created. So there was a method in how they were planning to, to not just do things from scratch, but actually develop the capability. And certainly the intention was that future um, ships for the Australian Navy would be built um, in Australia. And uh, that was certainly the case with the three follow-on destroyers, um, which was Huon, Swan and Torrens. Okay. Greg Gilbert, in 1913, uh, the, the Commonwealth took over the naval dockyard at Cockatoo Island. Can you describe the reaction in Navy office to that event? Right. Uh, the third naval member, who was the chief engineer, was Captain Clarkson. And uh, he basically disagreed from the start and said the selection of Cockatoo Island was a, a dreadful choice. He said, if you want to build a, uh, a shipbuilding capability in Australia for warships, then you needed to start on a green site and build from scratch. Forget about Cockatoo Island, forget about the entanglements with New South Wales. Uh, pick the site that's best for the nation, uh, which may, may not be New South Wales. Uh, he raised these, but uh, fundamentally, the Navy was not responsible for the selection of Cockatoo Island as the future dockyard uh, for naval work. It was a political decision. And this is an interesting that very early on we find that you get the Navy opinion or the defence opinion and then you get political decision making <coughs> and those political decisions may or may not reflect the uh, advice that's given to them uh, and those politicians made the decision to get Cockatoo Island. Interestingly, it's a question of how much they relied on the advice from the Australian Navy <coughs> board uh, that generally, if they didn't like the answers they were getting from the Australian Navy, the uh, politicians would go back to the British and ask the Admiralty or <coughs> someone else Excuse me. to uh, resolve that. John Jeremy, in the first few years of Commonwealth operation, a number of improvements were made to the dockyard. I'm just wondering if you can explain what happened. Well, yes, um, and having had some experience of operating Cockatoo Dockyard, I must say to some degree I agree with Clarkson. Um, an island is a ridiculous place to put a dockyard. It's logistically impossible, and Cockatoo Island was very constrained. The first general manager, John King Salter, who came to Australia from Britain to run the Commonwealth Naval Dockyard, faced a massive task. Um, the three destroyers, which David mentioned, had been ordered from the New South Wales government before the dockyard was taken over, as had the crews of Brisbane. 
and work began on those in January 1913. But the facilities on the dockyard uh, were far from the standard that were needed for the Commonwealth Naval Dockyard. Power supplies, for example, were desperately short, and even at one stage the uh, turbo generators from Brisbane were being used on the island to supply power to the island. The expansion was enormous. The workforce, <coughs> excuse me, at the beginning of World War I was probably about uh, 1,200 uh, people. By the end of 1919, there were 4,085 people working on Cockatoo Island. During uh, this period, King Salter had to build a dockyard as well as building the warships, uh, converting ships to carry troops to uh, Europe uh, and repairing Allied warships and doing all the other work that they did. Uh, the expansion of the dockyard during World War I was the biggest in its history. Um, new wharves, uh, new ferry wharves, new cranes, uh, new workshops, new machine shops, new foundries, uh, uh, residences on the island for dockyard staff. Um, it, it was a massive expansion um, and uh, it was difficult in those days to even find some of the equipment that was needed uh, and the dockyard ended up designing and building some of their own cranes for the machine shops, for example. And King Salter was keen to uh, put the machinery into Brisbane before she was launched, the uh, launching having been delayed because he was rebuilding the slipway underneath the ship. Um, and the dockyard designed and built its own 25-ton cantilever travelling crane out of timber uh, to enable this to be done. This was rather typical of the can-do kind of attitude which developed on Cockatoo Island in these years and in fact continued right throughout the operation of the dockyard. He also faced enormous labour problems. Uh, he complained on one occasion uh, that he had employees working under 51 different awards and it was impossible to manage a situation like this. Many people were brought out from England um, and it was in those days that an earlier relationship developed with Vickers in Barrow and Furness, uh, which was developed much further in later years in the dockyard's history. Uh, but despite all these difficulties, uh, at the end of uh, about 1920, the Navy had in Cockatoo Island um, a facility um, which was extremely capable uh, and built more or less along the patterns of a contemporary Royal Navy dockyard in the United Kingdom. Okay. David, you've written about Australia during the First World War. I'm just wondering, how did the dockyard perform during the war and what ships did it build? Yeah, well, it's like there's no simple answer <laughs> to a question like that for its no. performance. Um, <coughs> but certainly the ships that were built, um, I, we've mentioned the, the three destroyers, um, which were commenced before the war and, and finished, which were you know, quite successful. Um, the two major um, construction, which also we've mentioned, is the two light cruisers, Brisbane and then followed by Adelaide. Uh, but then there was later in the war, there was also some smaller ships, including a, um, a dredger, um, the Hercules, which was uh, quite, a, um, a, quite a significant achievement. But then when we created the Commonwealth, or the Prime Minister um, Hughes created the, the Commonwealth line late in the war, um, that's where a lot of the ships were built um, suddenly, at the, although they weren't necessarily completed before the end of the war. But just to go back for it, to give you an idea of the complexity of the, of the question, if you look at HMAS Brisbane, which um, had been commenced before the war, launched in 1915, and was in theory meant to um, be completed in, 26, uh, sorry, in 1916. Um, unfortunately, there was the, the, the difficulties with the unions have been mentioned. And certainly one of the, uh, the sort of um, powers there was what was called the International um, Workers of the World, which was an anti-war organisation. And certainly there was some association between the unions and this, uh, this, um, this grouping. And particularly when you think about the time period in 2016, when they're looking at the conscription refer referendum, um, you have a lot of people in the island who do not want Australia to be in the war, they certainly don't want to be providing weapons of war to the war. Yeah. And how do you protest? Well, there were certainly some incidents of sabotage, um, small scale sabotage, where sort of um, rags had been left in a place where they could catch fire. Um, a lot of leftover material in the wrong places, which subsequently caused problems. And in fact, the, the captain of, uh, of Brisbane, um, Claude Cumberledge, 
actually arranged to get the ship out, not exactly under cover of darkness, but to get the ship out suddenly before it was complete, absolutely completed, and with the idea that it, we could get it completed in Singapore um, um, after, after it got out of the island. Um, that said, um, they did, uh, the, the ship had some major problems um, just getting out of Sydney Harbour, there were failures, and I mean, that's not necessarily a, a, a problem of design, but obviously you, you didn't have much of a chance for a workup and problems did happen. And there was a major fire um, off the Australian coast where um, they lost a lot of their wiring. So um, the ship first went to Singapore in the hope that they could fit this, the uh, re repair and, and refit um, some of the electricals. And that um, didn't work because Singapore didn't have the uh, ability to have material and they ended up going to Malta. Um, and the interesting thing there is that, you know, the, it allowed the ship to be fitted with the latest equipment, um, repair all the white wiring, but the, the comment made by the Malta dockyard was the actual construction of the hull was as good as anything they'd seen elsewhere. So okay. in some aspects, the Cockatoo dockyard worked really well but there were certainly problems. Okay. John, you've mentioned that an island is a difficult place to put a dockyard. There are lots of things which go into a ship. How did they all get there? Oh, by water. Um, I have often quoted the example of uh, the last ship we built, HMAS Success, 17,800 tonnes of ship. Every single piece of that ship, be it steel, cable, everything, travelled across the water on a barge at least once to and from Cockatoo Island. And that was the case right through the history of the dockyard. Um, that's an, a logistic challenge. When you are actually doing it, you get very used to it. But realistically, of course, it, it's an expensive way of doing things. In the early days, um, uh, much of the material for the dockyard actually came through the Erskine Street Wharf in Darling Harbour. Okay. Um, others, uh, if it was steel, it might arrive in a ship which actually berthed at Cockatoo Island and offloaded on the island. In the, very, uh, well, in the last 50 years, uh, the dockyard uh, actually had its own shore depot in Balmain where uh, material came in. Uh, but it was not only uh, moving material onto the island, which was a challenge, you had to move thousands of people on and off the island every day as well. Uh, and in World War I, um, the dockyard built its own little ferry called Biloela uh, for that purpose and ran a fleet of uh, small uh, launches and, and other craft for moving uh, material and people on and off the island. Um, it was a 24-7 operation which continued right through the operation of the dockyard. Okay. Can I just add on that? Yes. The, the, when I worked there on the Navy side, the Navy also provided small boats mm. and I, recommend, I remember you would hail them from Cove Street and as the Navy boat went past in the distance, you'd say, quick, you know, come over here and these boats would pick you up. This is now all contracted in Sydney Harbour and half the, the runs are no longer there. Obviously, Cockatoo Island uh, doesn't work as a dockyard anymore. No, well, the and Navy... And you can't hail boats. No, the Navy had their own launch there as well. So in addition to the dockyard fleet of boats, the, the Navy had a boat dedicated on Cockatoo Island as well. Greg, just thinking a little bit more about shipbuilding on an island, um, I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the, some of the, the challenges that arose um, that, that come from uh, building ships there. Yeah, one, one of the things about the ship construction at Cockatoo Island in the First World War was that they initially relied very heavily upon the Royal Navy's or the Admiralty's supply system. Uh, as David said, uh, one of the earlier destroyers was disassembled and then sent to Australia to be reconstructed and uh, basically the hull to be riveted together. But uh, when it came to the, uh, the three destroyers that were built uh, later and the uh, HMAS Brisbane and, Canberra and Adelaide, the, a lot of the material was originally supposed to come from the UK. Now, that all made sense during peacetime. But during wartime, mm -hmm. you're now creating a demand for, in Australia, for high quality war, war fighting equipment, which the British need to fight the German fleet in the North Sea. So the priority that you would get for that item, they wanted to give it to Australia, but if there was an urgent demand in the 
North Sea, they would go to them. So there were delays involved. There were also some of the items that were sent were, were questionable, so of questionable quality. So for example, there were quarantined items that they must have thought, well, it's better to send something than nothing. Uh, it turns up in Australia and you say, after the long distance of sending items, you say, why do we want something that's not in the correct condition? Well, at least they could play with it. They don't know. At least they could manufacture and try and repair it and you know, do things like that. So that long supply problem uh, was a major limitation on what ship construction was done in Cockatoo. The way they got over it was from King Salter's uh, ideas was that really you have to set up the foundry and you have to make it yourself. So they started making and using the right machinery, which meant you had to buy a right lathe, which were difficult to get lathes out of the UK. So there's a whole string of things that have capabilities that were established at Cockatoo to meet the uh, counter, the strong delays and problems they were getting from supply of an overseas navy. Now, this problem is not just happening in the First World War. This happens throughout the life of the Australian Navy. Every time we buy a foreign ship, we rely on it. We'll say, oh, we'll buy the spare parts from overseas. No problems. But if they're in conflict or they have higher demands, we're on the bottom of the list. Quite rightly, I don't blame them. You know, the Brits were fighting a war in the North Sea, a war of national survival. Who really cared whether Australia had our, our destroyers or not, or cruisers? That's one thing. The other thing that I'd just like to highlight is that because we were relying on designers in the Admiralty, there was a big time delay, a delay between the manufacturer of ships in Australia and the new designs that were coming through. The our destroyers in the First World War were river-class destroyers, essentially. They were modified for Australia, but they were river-class destroyers, which were a generation older than the destroyers that the Brits were building in the First World War. So by 1916, when our destroyers were completed at Cockatoo Island, that's the second batch, uh, the British were building larger, faster, uh, destroyers with more guns uh, and very much more advanced. So by the end of the war, when we ended up with the brand new destroyers, we actually ended up with destroyers straight out of the UK. Uh, they were just delivered and they weren't manufactured at Cockatoo. The similar problem happened with the delays in that design and technology from the Admiralty with the cruisers. We, as David said, HMAS Brisbane was built to the standards as it was defined in the contract. It was delayed a little bit. But in the meantime, the British are fighting a war and doing constant changes to improve their fight fighting capabilities. To get those changes on board our ships was a problem. Going to Malta, you ended up getting the British fit. So uh, those type of design delays are an ongoing problem. The way, again, Cockatoo Island tried to fix it was through King Salter, who, who was a, a member of the Royal Corps of Naval Constructors. He was actually very high quality, admiralty trained shipbuilder uh, and naval architect. Now, he knew all about the admiralty standards and the admiralty standards that were used in design for warships were fundamental to designing and building warships in Australia. He, he gradually developed a small design office at Cockatoo. Not that they could initially design ships in First World War, but they could do minor changes, come up with alternative materials and things like that. John, for much of the First World War and the interwar period, um, Cockatoo Island was the sole source for um, ship, uh, warship building in Australia. Can you just talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of such an arrangement? Well, <coughs> the period, the 1920s, of course, were a very difficult period for the dockyard because the workload ran right down. The war to end all wars had, had finished. Um, the um, Commonwealth uh, line of steamers uh, were finished with the completion of Fordsdale and Ferndale at Cockatoo Island, uh, and the island had inadequate work. Um, 
it tended for, uh, in comp uh, for the construction of uh, turbines and, and condensers for the Bunner New Bunurong Power Station in Sydney in competition with private industry and won the contract. Uh, private industry took the Commonwealth to the High Court claiming that they had no right to use a facility established under the Defence Act for such purposes and won. So the dockyard was unable to get that extra work. It tended for uh, the construction of one of the two new cruisers which was, uh, Australia was to buy, um, which became HMS Australia and HMS Canberra. Uh, but the cost premium was too high and ultimately the uh, government decided that uh, they would buy both cruisers from Britain and with the £800,000 saved, built Australia's first aircraft carrier at Cockatoo Island, HMS Albatross. But by the end of the 1920s, uh, Cockatoo Island uh, was um, very short of work uh, and the Commonwealth tried to sell the island. Um, they were unsuccessful, but finally in uh, 1933, uh, the island was leased to a small company set up by interests associated with Davis Gelatin called Cockatoo Docks and Engineering Company Limited, um, a special purpose company, to run the dockyard under a 21-year lease. Um, the le this freed the dockyard to undertake any commercial work. It was no longer constrained by the High Court decision. Uh, but the lease was also underpinned by some guarantees in relation to naval work. Uh, the employment on the island fell to a minimum of about 400, 500 in the early 1930s, but gradually grew during the 1930s as um, there was a, a resurgent naval program for Australia with the construction of the sloops Yarra and Swan and later Parramatta and Warrigo, and then the modernisation of the cruisers towards the end of the decade. And right at the end of the decade, just before the war, the order from Cockatoo uh, for two tribal class destroyers and a third one a little bit later. Uh, so by the beginning of the war, uh, Cockatoo was beginning to build up in terms of its uh, capability and capacity. Um, but it was still the only um, shipyard in Australia which was actively building ships. Um, and uh, it, it was from Cockatoo that um, a new industry had to be created during the war um, to uh, sustain Australia's needs. Gentlemen, thank you. And I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Australian Naval History podcast series. There are plenty more to be found just by searching for Naval Studies Group in your podcast app. Goodbye now.